Good evening, everybody. Welcome. We'll just give it a few seconds for folk to come in. Good evening, folks who are just joining us. Hello, welcome. There, everyone just joining us. Thanks for joining. Welcome. Good evening. Nice to see some familiar names here. Hello, everyone. Good evening, folks who are just joining us. Thanks for coming on in tonight. We'll just give it a few more seconds for people to join. We've still got the numbers going up here. And OK, I think we'll make a start. Well, good evening, everybody, and a very warm welcome to the online Nature Trek Roadshow. For those of you who don't know me, I'm Sarah Frost, Nature Trek's marketing manager, and I've worked for Nature Trek for six years now. Title of marketing manager, I trained as a zoologist with a particular interest in marine life, and I'm a leader of our wildlife cruisers, and I'll be a host for this evening speaking to you from Hampshire. As many of you know, we'd normally be out on the road delivering these talks in person in different venues across the UK, but it is such a pleasure to continue for you, especially on a wet evening like this, and to be able to cover so many different destinations and continue bringing new speakers and their expertise to our evenings. We have 400 households joining us this evening, so we could guesstimate around 500 or 600 people and a very warm welcome of you or good morning if you're joining us from another time zone we continue to have people tuning in from overseas now we're well into our extended series of evening but if there are topics that you'd like to see us cover that we haven't done already then please do just let us know that it can shape our plans for future presentation ideas if we run these again later in the year as usual, please feel very welcome to use the chat section, which is at the bottom of the screen on a PC or at the top of the screen on an iPad. I have the option here to send messages to just those panelists or to all attendees. So do go ahead and include all attendees if you'd like to, if you're sending a message that you think would be useful for others to hear, perhaps if you're giving a helpful recommendation to others, for instance, it does create a nice chatty atmosphere. Uh, for those who are on smaller screens, an iPad. If you find any of the chat messages distracting, you can mute the chat by tapping the little bell icon. Furthermore, please do ask any questions you may have using the Q&A section on your screen, be it specific questions about the species or destination, or even broader questions about the travel industry as a whole. That's what we're here for, and we're more than happy to answer any of these questions and share our thoughts. Please pop your question into the Q&A area rather than in the chat section, just so we don't miss it, and we'll type replies to you but we'll also read questions out at 9.05 after the last presentation. Now, if you're on our mailing list, you'll have received our brand new brochure a couple of weeks ago, which is brimming with mouth-watering holidays to all parts of the globe to over 100 different destinations. But if you don't have a copy and you'd like to request one, drop us an email at info at naturetrek.co.uk and we'll be delighted to pop one in the post to you. Likewise, our website is a huge resource of information and details of our tours including detailed itineraries and is teeming with reports from previous holidays so please do go online and have an explore. Finally, people new to Zoom, don't worry we can't see or hear you, it's only the panellists that are in the spotlight. Now this evening we're returning to Africa for a third time tonight focusing on South Africa and Botswana and to tell us more we're joined by the familiar face of my colleague, Paul Stanbury, an operations manager who oversees numerous tours to yeah. Africa, as well as tour leaders, Ben Chappell, who's joining us from London, and Leo Murray, who's joining us from South Africa. Thank you both for joining us. Other speakers to introduce themselves as they come on. So Ben, you're going to kick off the evening by taking us to the Kruger in South Africa. So over to you. Thanks very much, Sarah. Um, if you just give me one minute, I will share my screen. Um, ignore the ammo leopard there, that's not found in um, South Africa. Let's see. How are we doing? Right, great. Okay, um, so as Sarah said, my name is Ben, 
and I am uh, I worked full time for Nature Track between 2018 and 2020. Um, I've now left and I'm now primarily based at the Zoological Society of London, um, where I'm doing research uh, in the African wild dog lab group there. Um, and yeah, this evening I'm going to be talking about one of my absolute favourite places in the world, uh, which is the Kruger National Park in South Africa. Uh, the Kruger is in the far northeast of South Africa, um, up on the border with Mozambique, uh, and it shares a very small northern border uh, with Zimbabwe. It's about 360 kilometres in length, and on average between 60 or 70 kilometres in width. Um, that makes it around 20,000 square kilometres in size in total, which puts it roughly at the same size as Wales. Uh, we have three tours that visit the Kruger, uh, a Kruger Mammals Tour, a Kruger Birds Tour, and a Just Cats Tour. And all three of these tours focus, uh, broadly speaking, on the southern section of the park. Uh, this is the area of the park with the highest diversity of habitats and the highest abundance of wildlife. And while um, we do occasionally visit more than two camps, all of our uh, tours to Kruger will visit at least two camps within the park. Uh, the most commonly visited are these two that I've circled here, uh, Skokuza in the southwest and Satara further north, which I've circled in yellow. Um, the area around Skakuza, which is on the banks of the permanent Sabi River, uh, is relatively dense, relatively densely vegetated, um, although it is one of the best areas of the park for all round game viewing. Uh, Satara, by contrast, is surrounded by relatively open grassy plains, and this area is more typically associated with large, larger herds of herbivores and their attendant predators. The third tour, Just Cats, uh, also visits the adjacent Sabi Sand Game Reserve, um, which, although it has relatively similar uh, habitat composition to the adjacent areas of the National Park itself, um, the overall experience in terms of game viewing and in terms of the accommodation can be very different. And I'll go into more detail about why that's the case a little bit later on. Now, accommodation in the Kruger itself um, is relatively simple, but perfectly comfortable. Um, these are typical sort of rondavels that you get in the park, um, although you can also expect um, bungalows and other similar kinds of accommodation. This is the typical interior of one of those units, uh, perfectly comfortable, fairly simple, not the sort of luxury that you might expect um, at high-end lodges, uh, but, but perfectly comfortable and, and more than suitable for our purposes. It does look a little bit luxurious, however, in comparison to uh, how I was traveling around the Kruger a few years ago. Um, I brought my own tent, but sadly, in some of the locations, the ground was so hard that I just couldn't get the tent pegs in at all. Um, I had to, you know, as I'm a, I'm a very resourceful person, I tried to tie the guy ropes around a barbecue and shut some of them into the doors of my car instead. Worked brilliantly, um, but I did have to be very careful not to drive off with the tent still attached. Uh, you'll be relieved to hear, I'm sure, that we, we don't tend to subject Nature Trek clients to this sort of treatment. Uh, some of the camps, a lot of the camps are in really beautiful locations around the park. Um, Skakuza, as I mentioned, is on the banks of the Sabi River, uh, and you can often see a fantastic variety of game uh, while within the camp itself. Both Skakuza and Satara are relatively large camps, and that means that there's plenty of habitat for birding, uh, and relaxed birding walks um, are a great thing to do in the middle of the day, especially between game drives. Uh, this is southern yellow-billed hornbill. Um, they can be really tame in camp, uh, especially if they're hoping to pick up scraps from around picnic areas. Uh, this is an African scops owl. Um, I actually took this picture uh, right outside the reception building at Satara Camp. It's not just birds that make their way into the camps. There's a variety of small mammals as well. Um, several species of mongoose, including dwarf mongoose, can occasionally be seen uh, inside some of the camps. And at night, it's always worth looking out for this species. This is brown greater galago, sometimes called thick-tailed bush baby. Um, can be seen in Skakuza at night, as well as some of the other more uh, well-vegetated camps. Uh, honey badgers come into some camps at night as well, hoping to find food. Uh, one night I was woken up by an enormous crashing sound and when I got up to investigate I caught a glimpse of a very happy looking honey badger disappearing into the darkness with most of what was supposed to have been my breakfast. Um, and at Satara, uh, African wildcats uh, even are sometimes seen uh, hunting around the rondavals at night. But of course it's the mammals and the other wildlife in the park itself, not just in the camps, that's the real attraction here. Uh, Kruger is an incredibly diverse reserve with over 500 species of bird and 137 species of mammal recorded. 
Um, we tend to do morning and evening game drives while in the park in vehicles like this one, uh, open-sided safari vehicles, which give you a great vantage point, um, both for viewing and for photography, um, if that's what you're interested in. Of course, the most famous amongst the mammals uh, in Kruger are the big five, and that's lion, leopard, elephant, buffalo, and rhino, both black and white rhinos. And all of these species are well represented in the park. Lions are fairly common. There are somewhere between 1,500 and 2,000 individuals in the park as a whole, which is up to around 10% of all the wild lions left in Africa. And the greatest numbers are found in the southern half of the park, which, as I mentioned, is where our tours tend to focus. Uh, and in particular, the grassy plains around Satara are thought to support one of the highest densities of wild lions on the planet. Um, and in several days in that area, you'd be very unlucky not to have um, at least a couple of sightings. There's also a healthy population of leopards in the park. Um, it is a secretive species, of course, and they tend to prefer much denser vegetation than lions. Um, but the thickets along the Sabi River are reported to support, again, one of the world's highest densities of leopards. And although most of our Kruger tours probably do see leopards, um, getting a really good sighting requires a bit of luck. That's not to say that amazing encounters aren't possible. Um, they absolutely are. Um, this is one of my favorite leopard sightings um, myself. Uh, this leopard is, is sleeping actually in the branches of what is the most southerly growing wild baobab tree on the African mainland. And when I first pulled up to this tree, um, I saw a crowd of vehicles staring adoringly up into the branches. And my first thought was that it was very refreshing to see people you know, paying so much attention to something that wasn't just you know, the big five all over again. Uh, and then I spotted the leopard and the illusion was shattered. But never mind, it's hard to complain too much about a, an amazing sighting like this. Elephants are common in the park. There are up to 20,000 individuals present. And in contrast to other areas of Africa, that number is actually increasing quite rapidly. Um, and that's, that can be a problem. Um, elephants are actually uh, quite a destructive species and they're actually causing a decline in tree cover in parts of the park, which has knock-on effects for all sorts of other creatures and plants, uh, including in particular, some birds that require mature woodland for breeding. Uh, the fourth member of the Big Five is the Cape Buffalo, um, here with an attendant red-billed oxpecker. And the relationship between oxpeckers and their hosts is often sort of held up as a shining example of symbiosis or mutualism. Um, the buffalo gets cleaned of parasites and the oxpecker gets a meal. Uh, but oxpeckers also have a really strong taste for blood. And by feeding on it, they can actually prevent open wounds from healing. Um, so perhaps it's not such a clear win-win after all. Now, if you were being, I suppose, ungenerous, uh, you could say that the buffalo is the least interesting member of the Big Five. Uh, in some senses, it's really just a cow, um, but I think they're fantastic animals. Um, the old males in particular have so much character um, and encountering a breeding herd, you know, many hundreds strong like this one here, uh, could be a truly spectacular experience. The fifth member of the Big Five is actually two species, uh, black rhinoceros and white rhinoceros. Uh, this is a white rhino, which is mostly a grazing species, which explains its other name, which is square-lipped rhino. And when the, the Kruger was first proclaimed back in the late 19th century, uh, rhinos had already been wiped out from the area. Um, but they were reintroduced from the 1960s onwards. And by 2010, the population had ridden, risen to perhaps as many as 10,000 white rhinos, which would was by far the largest single rhino population in the world. And in fact, at that time, there are probably more white rhinos living in the wild in Kruger than wild rhinos of the other four species in the rest of the world put together, which is an extraordinary, um, extraordinary statistic. There are black rhinos too in the park. They're much less common than white rhinos and they prefer areas with much denser vegetation. So they do tend to be a lot harder to see. And as I'm sure uh, all of you will be aware, uh, particularly over the last decade, uh, rhinos in Africa have been heavily, heavily hit by poaching. And Kruger, partly because of its vast size, partly because of its very large rhino population, and also this very long, uh, porous border with Mozambique to the east, um, has been really badly affected. And probably more than half of all the rhinos poached in Africa uh, over the last 10 years have actually been poached in the Kruger itself. And sadly, that does mean that over the last few years, rhinos have become appreciably harder to see in Kruger, um, although uh, seeing them is, is, is far from impossible. And over the course of a, of a trip to the park, you would still stand a good chance of, of having a few sightings. 
Now, although the species I've just been talking about are undoubtedly spectacular, um, I've always been a little bit confused by the obsession with the Big Five. Um, as many of you will know, the term was originally coined by big game hunters to describe the five most dangerous African animals to hunt on foot. And it's not immediately obvious that those species would also be the most desirable for wildlife tourists. And Kruger, as I've mentioned, is an incredibly diverse reserve. Um, and it's home to so many other equally extraordinary species. Um, 137 species of mammal, including more species of large mammal than any other park uh, on the continent. Uh, and almost uniquely amongst large African parks, that includes essentially all of the most iconic savanna species um, that you can think of in Africa. Uh, one of those is the giraffe. Um, it's not might not be a member of the big five, but I sort of defy anyone to say it's not one of the most extraordinary species of animal that, that has ever existed. They, they really are remarkable. Hippos are common too, especially in the permanent river systems. Um, on our tours, that mostly uh, means the Sabi River. And there's a huge variety of general plains game. Uh, this is plains zebra and blue wildebeest. Uh, the largest number of both these species are found uh, on the open plains around Satara. Uh, other species include impala on the top left. This is by far the most numerous species in the park with um, several hundred thousand individuals. A greater kudu with the curved horns on the top right. Uh, water buck and then the beautiful but quite rare sable in the bottom left. And this is this is sort of assortment of prey animals supports a really diverse assemblage of predators as well, um, including some that are usually thought of as scavengers, um, spotted hyena and both black-backed and side-striped jackal. One of the best way of seeing some of these animals is to take a night drive. Um, unlike in some African parks, night drives are allowed, um, but they can only be taken in vehicles uh, run by the, the camps themselves and um, accompanied by national park guides. Uh, but these do provide an opportunity to see a range of species that are either impossible or very hard to see during the day. Um, that includes birds such as night jars and this amazing and enormous Vero's eagle owl in the middle. Um, a range of small mammals like porcupine, civets and genets, uh, bush babies are also possible to see, along with uh, big cats on the hunt. But the park's rarest predators are uh, actually mostly active during the day. My personal favourite uh, is the African wild dog. Um, there are somewhere around two or three hundred wild dogs in Kruger, which sounds like a small number and, and is in fact a, a very small number. Uh, but when you consider that there may be as few as 3,000 left across the entire continent, then clearly Kruger is an important stronghold. And although I'm potentially biased, I, I mentioned at the beginning of this talk that, that I spend most of my time uh, researching wild dogs uh, now, I really do think it's one of the most beautiful and fascinating mammals in the world. Even when they're resting, they're usually doing something interesting, like grooming each other or playing. And you, you contrast that with lions, which spend almost all of their time totally fast asleep, uh, doing very little of interest at all. Kuriga is a good place to see them. Uh, our tours have a decent success rate, uh, considering that they are ultimately a very rare and especially a very wide ranging mammal. Um, but their greatest Southern African stronghold is in Northern Botswana. And I'm sure, I'm sure you'll be hearing a little bit more about them from Paul uh, later on. Cheetah is another uncommon large predator. Uh, it's most frequently seen in their favorite open grassy habitats like those around Satara. This is one of my favorite sort of all time sightings of cheetah I've had in Kruger. Um, this is on the road a few kilometers north of Satara. This mother cheetah who's looking up, up towards the camera had just killed this male impala uh, to feed her four almost fully grown cubs. But within a few minutes of the kill already, these numbers of white backed vultures in the background had started arriving. And I'm not sure if you can see it as a black backed jackal um, just on the right there as well. And within a few minutes, there were so many vultures, they actually had the confidence to force the cheetahs off the kill entirely, uh, kicking off this absolutely almighty feeding frenzy. Um, you can see the jackal again, just on the right hand side, um, waiting sort of patiently for an opportunity to grab some scraps from the melee of feathers. And I particularly love this picture because it shows a scene that's actually becoming increasingly rare, not just in Africa, but, but everywhere where there are vultures, um, which are sadly declining pretty rapidly um, across Africa and beyond. Kruger is still a place where you can see good numbers of large birds, uh, birds in particular that are now very scarce outside all but the largest protected areas. That includes some really beautiful and spectacular birds of prey, uh, battleur, a white-headed vulture, Vero's eagle owl again in the middle, African fish eagle on top right and tawny eagle. 
There's even a birding big six, which is a list of six of the park's most charismatic and iconic species. And that includes the amazing lappet faced vulture, um, a really spectacular and striking bird. Saddle billed stork, arguably the most beautiful of all the world's stork species. Uh, the enormous Corrie Bustard, um, which competes for the title of being the, the world's heaviest flying bird. Africa's largest eagle, the Marshall Eagle, um, which feeds on par in part on monkeys and birds like guinea fowl. And the amazing southern ground hornbill, um, whose booming territorial calls um, can actually be heard from up to several kilometers away. Uh, I particularly like this picture on the, on the right where the ground hornbill is being watched by a mostly underground giraffe. Um, those five members of the big six that I've just described are all relatively easy to see in Kruger, and you'd probably expect to see most of them um, on our tours. Uh, the sixth is, is, is very different. This is Pell's fishing owl. Um, it's, it's pretty rare in Kruger um, and definitely takes some dedicated effort to find. Um, there are much better places elsewhere in Africa to find them. Um, all of the big six birds are resident. Um, birding is fantastic year round, um, but Nature Trek's birding tours to Kruger go between November and February. Um, when resident species are joined by a host of migrants. Um, that includes some species that are traveled from within Africa. Um, that includes uh, woodland kingfisher on the top right, violet-backed starling, and the gorgeous southern carmine bee eater. But it also includes some species that are probably familiar to those of us who've done quite a bit of birding in Europe. Um, red-backed shrike, Eurasian golden oriole, European roller, uh, European bee eater. And our birding tours, uh, which spend a total of four nights in the park, as well as birding some of the adjacent highland areas, uh, regularly record well in excess of 300 species. There's a really nice range of reptiles in the park too. Uh, black necked agama, a flat necked chameleon, um, some enormous Nile crocodiles, and several species of freshwater turtle, um, some of which occasionally like to get a lift on other animals. Um, while this African rock python um, had a, a sort of antelope sized bulge halfway down its body, which was pretty spectacular. And after a meal like that, um, this snake might not have had to eat again for, for several months. And although the reptiles are, don't tend to be the focus of, of tours, uh, they can occasionally stop the traffic themselves. Now, this is a leopard tortoise here. That brings me on very briefly to something that is occasionally seen as a negative perception of Kruger, which is that uh, sightings can get busy with traffic. That can be true. Um, and if there's uh, a static sighting, like a, like a sort of clown of hyenas feeding on a kill or a pride of lions lying by the side of the road, uh, particularly if that sighting is near one of the main rest camps, then uh, yeah, traffic can build, can build up um, quite a bit. But ultimately, there are nearly 3,000 kilometers of roads in Kruger, um, and our guides always know how to get off the beaten track if they need to. Um, and you know, sightings are unique, so the solo sightings of amazing wildlife uh, are always possible. Um, and in such a vast area, it's, um, it's never too hard to get away from, from crowds. This is one of my favorite pictures. I think this highlights um, one of the things that makes Kruger really special. Um, there are very few places in the world where you could see two such endangered species as African wild dog and white rhino interacting. Now I'd like to talk uh, just at the end of this talk about uh, the Sabi Sand Game Reserve, which is an area of private land adjacent to the Kruger, um, which is visited on our Just Cats tour. And as I mentioned earlier, the experience, uh, although the range of habitats is quite similar to adjacent areas, the game viewing experience and the experience of the accommodation is really quite different. Uh, unlike in Kruger, uh, where there are basically no restrictions on how long you can be out during the day, uh, game drives in the Sabi Sands tend to take place within the first few hours of the day and the, first, um, the last few hours before dusk. Uh, the rest of the day is spent relaxing at the lodge, um, where the standard of accommodation and food is really uh, much higher than in Kruger, um, really quite luxurious um, in a lot of cases. And while exploration of the Kruger itself allows you to see a wide variety of habitats and landscapes, in the Sabi Sands, the focus is much more on securing your really intimate close-up encounters with large mammals, and in particular, big cats. And while such sightings require a bit of luck in the Kruger itself, uh, in the Sabi Sands, they're as close to guaranteed as you can get with nature. And that's largely because, unlike in the National Park, uh, guides are allowed to drive off-road which both allows animals to be approached more closely and also allows guides to actively track the animals. And that means the guides can use uh, the skills that they have in a much more, um, much more comprehensive way to find wildlife. 
Um, this guy sitting out on the bonnet is a dedicated tracker, and they are really very, very skilled um, in terms of their ability to find elusive wildlife. Uh, and in contrast to Kruger, that means that close-up sightings are therefore not dependent on the animals already being close to the roads. The number of vehicles at each sighting is also closely controlled in the Sabi Sands, uh, so there's no chance of any crowding. And while the Sabi Sands is absolutely fantastic for close-up views of lions, elephants, rhinos, and other iconic species, as well as occasional cheetah and wild dog, it's most famous for its leopards. And there are several places, both in Africa and in Asia, that I suppose could plausibly lay claim to being the best place in the world to see leopards. Um, I think it's very hard to look past the Sabi Sands. Um, the sheer reliability of intimate, you know, relaxed encounters with what is normally a very shy and reclusive species is absolutely astonishing. Uh, individual leopards in Sabi Sands are well known to guides, their movements are monitored, and they tend to be very, very well habituated to vehicles. Um, and these factors combine you know, to produce cons consistently outstanding sightings, um, including an intimate behavior that's rarely observed elsewhere. Uh, it really is amazing. Uh, and if predators are your priority, then I, I can't recommend the Sabi Sands and the Just Cats tour um, highly enough. Now, Kruger and Sabi Sands provide very different but equally wonderful experiences um, of what is an amazing ecosystem. Um, there's a spectacular diversity of wildlife in and around Kruger, um, and it is really one of the most important reserves, not just in Africa, but also on the whole planet. Um, when we can travel again, um, it'll be the first place I head back to, and I hope I've persuaded some of you to visit as well. Um, thank you for listening. Um, I will hand over now to Leon, who's going to talk about uh, South Africa's rare mammals. Thank you. Right, uh, good evening there all nature trekkers. Um, my first question to you is uh, who wants to see an art park? And I guess there are gonna be quite a few hands up for that one. Uh, but a bit about me before we get into the tour details. Uh, firstly, thanks for taking the time to tune in and I hope you're safe and well at home there. and not too depressed about not being able to travel at the moment. Um, as you know, my name's Leon Marais. I'm a born and bred South African. I'm a professional guide based in Nalspreit, um, Pumalanga, which is not too far from the Kruger National Por uh, Park, fortunately. Uh, the southwestern corner is only about an hour's drive away from my house. Uh, I've been guiding for Nature Trek since about 2005, if I remember correctly. So it's another warm evening here. Obviously, we're in midsummer. Uh, we have a national curfew in place, so even if I wanted to be out on the town, uh, I couldn't be. Um, you know, to be honest, uh, we're having a rather lousy time here in South Africa at the moment, as I'm sure you are there, um, a year into the hard end of this pandemic. I personally haven't done any guiding since uh, late March 2020, close to a year ago. I'm finding it very tough not being in the field on a regular basis, uh, but at least I'm still healthy and I'm earning uh, some kind of income, uh, which is more than what can be said for many in our embattled tourism industry. But uh, we, we soldier on, uh, waiting for the day when we can welcome you back on African soil. So right, so down to business, let's talk about the Nature Trek uh, Rare Mammals, South Africa's Rare Mammals itinerary. Um, it's an exciting tour, obviously with the main, main aim of seeing the unusual mammal species you don't usually see on a regular safari. If you've already done a few safaris, um, you've seen all the main species and perhaps looking for something a little bit different, uh, then this tour is just a ticket. So I'm just waiting for my slide to change over there. Sorry, I just seem to be having a problem with my PowerPoint uh, presentation here, if you'll just bear with me. I'm just going to stop sharing quickly and see if I can sort that out. Yeah, if you just want to stop sharing, Leon, and then uh, maybe restart it and see if it will come back. Okay, let me give it a go.
Sorry about this, folks. Hopefully we'll be up and running just in a second. Thank you all for bearing with us. Okay, I'm go. back. Yeah, that's great. Thanks, Leon. Sorry, folks. Sorry. <laughs> okay, so back to where I was. Now, the eastern parts of the country of South Africa, including Kruger National Park and adjacent private reserves such as uh, Sabi Sand Game Reserve, offer a superb regular safari experience, as Ben has just explained to us so nicely, with obviously with exposure to the classic big game species of Africa, uh, such as elephant, lion, rhinoceros. Buffalo, hippo, etc., as well as the incredible array of plains game species. So that's basically all the classic species you'd want to see on an African safari, and as well as some incredible bird life as well, of course. But uh, if you're interested in interested in seeing uh, the more unusual species, such as art fox, um, art wolf, bat-eared fox, cape fox, uh, cape porcupine, meerkat small spotted cat, uh, African wildcat, and even caracal, uh, then the prospects are generally far better in the central and western parts of the country. And that's where we go to on this tour. Now, there are a number of reasons that it's easier to see these in this part of the country, uh, apart from the fact, obviously, that some of these species don't occur in the east. Uh, you don't get small spotted cat, for example, in the east of the country. Um, so firstly, the country is generally drier, um, so it's more open, affording uh, better visibility on the whole. Uh, secondly, there are various species of termites that uh, flourish in these arid environments. Uh, termites, of course, being a major part of the diets of species such as art park uh, and art wolf and bat eared fox. And then lastly, uh, the density of large predators, uh, lion and leopard specifically, uh, is generally low. Uh, and even pretty much uh, non-existent in some of the areas we visit. Uh, so the smaller carnivores just aren't predated upon as much. And in fact, uh, in areas where even leopards have been removed from the landscape, uh, the caracal becomes the apex predator in the environment. So let's uh, have a look at the geography quickly of the tour. Um, here's a basic route map. Obviously, you're going to fly into Johannesburg and then get a short flight down to Bloemfontein in the Free State. And that's where the road part of the trip begins. Uh, we'll drive from there down to New Home Karoo Guest Farm, uh, where we spend our first three nights of the tour. And from there, we up to Kimberley, more or less in the center of the country for two nights. And then trekking west to Okabe's Falls National Park, where we have another two nights and then up to the Kalahari Transfrontier Park on the border with Botswana uh, for our final three nights before heading back to Uppington and then getting another shortish flight back to Johannesburg. So when you arrive in Bloemfontein, uh, you'll meet up with your South African guides. Uh, we'll be waiting there for you. And after loading up to the vans, we'll drive down to the Khoisan Karoo Conservancy, uh, which is situated near Hanover in the middle of the Great Karoo, uh, in what's known as the Nama Karoo Biome, one of South Africa's seven biomes. This is a semi-arid region of gra gravelly plains and craggy mountain ranges, uh, with relatively low impact, uh, extensive sheep farming as the main economic activity. Though, fortunately, there is a, an increasing turn towards conservation, as is with the case of the Khoisan Karoo Conservancy, where we will be staying. So we have three nights there, uh, staying at a uh, new home guest house, and we'll be hosted and guided by a gentleman by the name of PC Ferreira, who's the owner and developer of the farm and, and very passionate, 
passionate about what he's created there. So our daytime activities will include uh, morning birding and uh, general game viewing drives. But of course, it's at night when our target species are most active and we'll have three nights in total, giving us good chances of seeing this curious creature, um, the aardvark, which is arguably the top species for the tour, as well as aardvark and small spotted cat, also known as black footed cat, which are probably the two most other sought after species among various other, other goodies. Then some great uh, traditional South African hospitality and home cooked meals will be part of the package. Uh, so you can prepare to eat uh, a lot of good food and be very well looked after. And this goes for almost all of the country in general. Um, the standard of food is very high. Uh, the hospitality is second to none. Uh, at least we like to think so. And which I'm sure you'll know if you've been here before. Right, from a uh, new home, we trek uh, northwards up to Kimberley, um, which is a site, historically the site of the famous big hole, as they call it, uh, the largest hand dug hole in the world, where eager miners dug for diamonds in the late 1800s. We have two nights here, uh, staying at a guest house in town, and during our full day, we'll explore the nearby Mokala National Park. Now, Mokala is a little bit different to our other national parks in that rather than holding all the species that would have occurred there before the large scale elimination of animals occurred in the 19th and early 20th centuries, they haven't actually restocked with apex predators such as lion and leopard. And it's rather used as a conservation space for some endangered species such as roan antelope, which you can see lying in front of the zebra there, and sable antelope. Uh, which didn't occur in an area in the area naturally. These can be then used to stock uh, other parks and of course allows us to see these majestic animals in a very scenic environment. Now you may note looking at the zebras there that they have uh, much less uh, bold striping than what is normal and in fact uh, these are bred specifically like this to try and replicate uh, the extinct pacha of the Cape which was a plain zebra color variant. It wasn't a full species, just a variant um, that had basically minimal to almost no striping. And it was hunted to extinction in the late 1800s. I think the last uh, female or the last living specimen of female died in Amsterdam Zoo in 1883. So you'll see a lot of zebras like this uh, younger one in the foreground here with the pale, pale rumps and very low key striping. Now, black and white rhino also occur in the park. Uh, you may be lucky enough to see uh, one or two of these endangered and unfortunately increasingly endangered animals. Uh, we'll also see the likes of black wildebeest, a South African endemic mammal endemic to our interior grasslands, uh, along with uh, bontebok, another endemic uh, ungulate. Now, we normally try to arrive at Makala as early as possible. Uh, which is usually not quite a daybreak, uh, considering that we would have had a late night behind us with the night drive. Uh, sometimes from these night drives, you can get back to the rooms at 11 o'clock at night. Um, but we'll spend much of the day exploring the park, um, then arriving back in town for a chance to rest uh, before an early dinner and departure for Marrick, which is our night drive venue. You've got to like night drives for this tour. There's a lot of them. So here we basically have another shot at some of the more uh, elusive nocturnal animals uh, with two night drives in total. And even if we manage to see Art Park and Art Wolf, et cetera, at New Home, uh, there's nothing wrong with some more views of these species. Plus you never know with the weather, of course, and the unpredictability of nature. Uh, so it's good to have more chances for our main target species. So for the, the three main targets, the Art Park, Art wolf and small spotted or black footed cat. We have five night drives in total. And uh, in terms of weather, if you do decide to join this tour, you need to be prepared for possibly some cold night drives, depending on the specific weather at the time, and especially on the September tour. Because believe me, this part of the country can become pretty cold under certain weather conditions. And being cold on a night drive can be a fairly miserable experience. So by now, we'll hopefully have had numerous art park sightings uh, under our belts, along with art park and a few other specials. It'll be time to move on. 
with a bit of a long but uh, quite scenic drive through some incredible arid country scenery as we make our way westwards to Akrabi's Falls National Park. This park is centered on the amazing falls on the, the Kharip or the Orange River. Remember in South Africa, we always have to have multiple names for every geographical feature. Uh, these are actually a giant cataract where the water falls 183 feet into an 18 kilometer long steep sided gorge. This photo is taken in the dry season, uh, but in the wet season, the falls can be quite something. At the moment, they are coming down tremendously. Uh, you've got some time, Google Akrabi's Falls, February 2021, and, and look at the pictures. It's quite something. So the, and the place name actually derives from ancient Poikoi word meaning place of great noise. So it's pretty impressive overall, as is the uh, rugged scenery in the, in the park which is strikingly moonscape-like in places and obviously very different to what you used to over there. Then during the day, one can have uh, some fantastic views and, and observation periods of the rock hyraxes in the camp that seem to occupy almost every rock, uh, while the reserve itself is home to species such as Hartman's mountain zebra, uh, an arid region specialist. Uh, these ones are actually introduced from Namibia, which is not far away as the crow flies as well as South African giraffe, which uh, does appear to be a somewhat unusual species to find in this environment. Then the likes of uh, Clipspringer, Red Hartebeest, Gemspok, uh, Cape Ground Squirrel, Noki or Dussy Rat, a little rodent we see quite often, a number of mongoose species. Uh, the colorful Broadleys or Okrabi's Flat Lizards in the top left picture there, which actually featured in one of the Attenborough series. Then uh, Cape, Cape Crawless Otters are usually quite easy to see in the river, um, but usually at quite a distance down in the gorge, but with a spotting scope, uh, not, not bad views by any means. Then the night drives can produce art ball, African wildcat, uh, Cape Porcupine, even Caracal and Leopard. We have had some groups seeing Leopard. But uh, just a note on the night drives, yeah, they were canceled last year when the pandemic hit. And we're currently not sure if they'll be on offer again. I've emailed the camp manager and I just uh, can't get a solid answer out of them. But obviously, we'd hope that they will be uh, on offer again once there's a more normal travel situation in place. The accommodation uh, comprises typical South African national park chalets. Uh, nothing too fancy, but clean, comfortable and uh, very practical. Right, uh, moving on from Akrabi's to our last stop, uh, we'll pass back through Uppington, the uh, regional capital of the Northern Cape, as we make our way to the Kalakadi Transfrontier Park. This incredible bi-national park uh, covers parts of both uh, South Africa and Botswana, straddling the international border. Uh, it's massive at around 38,000 square kilometers or 14,600 square miles and containing within it some of the remotest places in Southern Africa. Needless to say though, we will in our three nights there will only see a tiny portion of the park uh, with our three nights at Tuirafiran, which is the main, main park camp at the southern tip of the park, which is basically right at the bottom of that green, green shaded area on the map. We usually try to stay at uh, Tuirafiran or Two Rivers Rest Camp, um, but it's often hard to get avail availability there. Um, the park is very popular and the camps are generally quite small. Um, so as an alternative, we stay at Kalakadi Lodge, uh, which is a private establishment just outside the park. Um, it's literally about five minutes drive from the gate, so it's not too much of a hassle at all. Uh, in a way, it actually works better that way, staying at Kalakadi Lodge as they have a far superior restaurant to the government camp, as you can probably imagine. So what we typically try to do on our stays here is arrange for packed breakfast and depart camp as early as possible for an extended drive into the park. This is the road up the Nos, leading up the Nossob riverbed and I'm sure the, the blue skies and the warmth that you can feel in this photo are pretty appealing to you guys right now. But as mentioned, uh, the park is, is large, the distances are huge and as the environment is generally arid, uh, the density of species is not as high as it is in the Kruger National Park, for example. There are no elephants, buffaloes, rhinos, hippos, zebras, etc. Uh, so one must generally expect to go for quite long periods between significant sightings. 
The routes are fairly limited as well, basically following the two dry riverbeds, uh, Nosov and the Owl, uh, along which are a series of artificial water points. Not really water holes as one would think of them, they're just tiny uh, uh, drinking troughs really, uh, which is pretty much where all the action occurs in the dry season. If you head off into the dune fields there, you see in the background between the dry riverbeds, you can drive for miles and miles and see you know, the odd skin buck and the odd northern black Quran. Everything happens along these riverbeds, basically. So the filler species, as I call them, uh, filling in the gaps between the exciting animals include the, mag the magnificent chemspok, as we call it, or oryx, you might know it as, uh, one of the classic arid environment species from this part of the world, very photogenic as well as the likes of springbuck, um, another arid area specialist, uh, blue wildebeest, earland, red hartebeest, and skienbuck. But of course, uh, it's the more unusual stuff that we really after, and the Kalahari has a lot of, of it. Uh, you just need to find it. Things we'll look out for include African wildcat, um, quite common there, and it can be found during the day resting up in the large camel thorn trees that line the riverbeds. I say quite common as well, but you don't, uh, you don't always see them. They're not always easy to see. As well as meerkats in the top left there, of course, everybody's favorite. Uh, slender mongoose on the bottom left picture there. Uh, the form we get here in the Kalahari is a lovely browny red coloration as opposed to the more yellow ones in the east. As well as bat-eared fox. Um, Brown hyena, cape fox, spotted hyenas, uh, black-backed jackal, honey badger, uh, yellow mongoose. Now, this little guy, the South African ground squirrel, was actually very common, but actually quite remarkable as well, as they use their tails as in sunshade, uh, which allows them to feed right through the heat of the day. And virtually every other species is either resting up in the shade or in an underground burrow. As well as these little guys, Brant's whistling rats that are quite common living in little warrens in the soil, uh, provide food for all manner of predators from the Cape Cobras all the way up to the leopards. And speaking of the big cats, things like cheetah and leopard as well. And with some luck, maybe even one of these, the elusive caracal, which is very high up on most people's want list. And of course, no visit to the park is quite complete without seeing a big, Black man Kalahari lion. With a lot of luck. There are some truly magnificent specimens there. Okay, we'll also have night drives at Tupira Piran or Kalahari Lodge, either one, again, offering the chance to see South Africa's rare and unusual mammals out and about after dark, such as the uh, common but rather curious spring head, which is actually a, a type of rodent, a large rodent moving around on its back legs like the mini kangaroo. It's often dubbed the, the African kangaroo by guys as well as things like Cape Porcupine, a small spotted genet, African wildcat, etc. Okay, um, I haven't mentioned the birds that we see, may see on this itinerary yet, as it's primarily a mammal tour. Um, but of course, we'll still look at some of the birds. It's hard not to. And the guides on this tour are almost all pretty uh, sharp birders as well. Highlights include some wonderful raptor species. Um, Kalahari or Kalahari in particular is well known as, known as a raptor hotspot. We look for species such as Marshall Eagle, Battler, Secretary Bird, uh, Lana and Redneck Falcons, Pygmy Falcon in the top left there, a wonderful tiny little bird of prey, um, Southern Pale Chanting Goshawk, Greater Kestrel, Gabar Goshawk, African Area Hawk, and a number of others, as well as some uh, great owls. Everybody tends to love owls, and you may even see some of them in their daytime roosts. We we're looking for species such as Southern White Faced Owl. Uh, barn owl, Barrow's eagle owl, the big one, and spotted eagle owl. Then the likes of uh, species such as uh, Cory Bustard, northern black Corahan, common ostrich. It's actually significant here that you can see truly wild specimens. Uh, several sand grouse species, and then some really colorful and charismatic uh, birds such as crimson breasted shrike, just stunning with that red breast, uh, swallowtail bee eater. Lilac breasted roller, southern yellow billed hornbill, and a number of others. 
right? Then the, uh, the seed eaters are actually abundant in the semi-arid environment as well. And as they have such a low moisture diet, they're actually heavily dependent on the surface water. So the water holes can attract large numbers of doves, uh, sand grass, finches, waxbills, etc. And these in turn are preyed upon by falcons and kestrels and goshawks ambushing them out of the, out of the surrounding trees. Um, even jackals and caracals and leopards for that fact, uh, making for some incredible action scenes around the water holes at, time, at times. So you just need to have a, a heavy dose of patience for that. And that's what a lot of the South African visitors go there for actually is for taking photographs around the water holes. For me though, one of the most astounding species uh, is small and brown, um, but it builds what must be the most remarkable bird nests on the planet. Uh, it's the sociable weaver endemic to southwestern Africa. And these nests are actually the largest structures built by any bird species in the world. And believe me, they're pretty impressive. Uh, that big tree you see in the main photo is it's a big mature tree. It's probably 30 feet high at least. Uh, so those are some significant nests. Now, they're not just impressive in size, uh, but also in how they manage to suspend their nests from various structures. Uh, any structure such as road signs, telephone poles, cell phone towers, you name it. So it's uh, truly amazing. So after our three nights uh, in the Kalahari or the Kalahari as they call it now, um, we'll, we'll have a relatively early departure on the last morning back to Uppington by car, uh, where you catch a midday flight to back to Johannesburg and then on to the UK. Uh, basically wrapping up what is another fantastic nature trek wildlife experience in South Africa. Of course, uh, as you know, by now an H-Trek offers a whole range of options in South Africa with different focus areas, um, the general safaris, the cats, uh, birds, botany, etc. cetera. Uh, plus there's a whole host of tailor-made options available. There's just so much to see and something for all nature and travel enthusiasts. So that's it from me. That's my punt of South Africa. Uh, please feel free to ask any questions. I'll do my best to answer them. And we're really looking forward to hosting you here back in South Africa at some point in the future. Thank you. That was fantastic. Thanks so much, Leon. Thank you, Ben. And uh, it's just fantastic images coming from, from both of you. I love the African ground squirrel uh, photo, Leon, using its tail like an umbrella. That, that did make me smile. <laughs> We're going to go to a quick break now. Um, we'll have minutes um, so we'll rejoin at uh, 8 30 where Paul will take us over to Botswana so we'll be back in just over five thank you
welcome back everybody. I'm now going to hand you over to Paul, who is taking us over to Botswana. Over to you. Thank you very much, Sarah. Uh, just bear with me one moment while I share my screen. There. Right. Um, yeah, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you very much for, for tuning in tonight. Um, my name's Paul Stanbury, and I am an operations manager at Nature Track. I, I work at the Nature Track office, or actually at home at the moment, but hopefully we'll be back in the office soon. I've been with Nature Trek now for about 26 years, um, and I look after a wide range of different destinations around the world. Um, Southern Africa, um, obviously, because I'm talking about Southern Africa tonight. Um, a lot of our cruises, a lot of our Asian destinations, um, as well as quite a wide range of, of different places. Um, occasionally, I'm let out to, to lead as well. So, of course, I absolutely love the travel part of, uh, of, of, of working for Nature Trek. My real interest is, is birds and mammals, but I'm very keen on all aspects of natural history. So, as Sarah mentioned, I'm going to take you on safari up in Botswana soon. But before I do that, I'm just going to finish off our, um, our um, journey around South Africa um, with just a few images on South Africa's Western Cape. This is quite different to the um, to Kruger National Park that, that Ben showed you um, and to the rare mammals itinerary that, that Leon um, run through earlier. The Cape is quite is a very different area in, in South Africa, so it has almost a Mediterranean um, feel about it. Um, and it's home to some, some wonderful um, mammals, birds, and in particular, um, botany. So, so all trips down to South Africa's Western Cape begin with a long flight from London down to Cape Town, right down at the southern tip of the, the African continent. And when we arrive in, in Cape Town, uh, we, have a, we, say we have a variety of tours that, that explore this area. Um, we have um, bet the one we call the best of the Cape, which is split between Cape Town and, and Hermanus, further along the coast. Um, we have our Go Slow in the Western Cape trip, which just um, spends a week at a really nice hotel just outside uh, Cape Town. We have um, our Cape and Namakwaland tour, which flies into Cape Town and then goes further north up, in, up, in, up into Namakwaland. So a right range of different, um, different itineraries to, to, to choose from. Um, the key areas I've, I've marked out on the map here. So we've got Cape Town, obviously, where we fly into. Two bays further to the east, False Bay and Walker Bay. Hermanus um, on, on the coast, which overlooks Walker Bay. And that's one of the key areas to look for um, southern right whales. Most southerly tip um, on the continent is, is Cape, Cape Agulhas. And then heading north, we've got the West Coast National Park, about a couple of hours to the north of Cape Town. And then we go up out of the Western Cape province into the Macrolan for the wonderful displays of flowers um, that, that occur in, in, in the South African spring, um, which is, which is our, our autumn. So all of our trips though begin with a flight into Cape Town and here we're looking across uh, to, to Table Mountain. Um, and um, we use a range of different hotels in the Cape Cape region, all of which are, are, are very nice, all on sweet facilities, of course, all in a good location. We choose our hotels um, for, the, uh, for their location to the wildlife and their location to the areas that, that we want to explore. I've just included a couple here just as, a, as an example. So we've got the Whaleview Manor, which is the hotel we use on our Go Slow in the Western Cape trip. That's right on the edge of False Bay, views out over the bay, lots of wildlife to see from the from the lodge, from the hotel. This is a trip you can, if you don't really want to dash around, do long walks, just take things a little bit easier, um, then this is a nice relaxing general wildlife trip. Um, and then we've got the Windsor Hotel um, in, in Hermanus, so just, just along the coast. Again, great location because it's right on the edge of the cliff overlooking Walker Bay so you can actually see southern right whales from from the hotel quite often from your from from, from your bedroom window. We run most of our Cape trips, in fact 
we on all of our Cape trips say in the South African spring um, in August, September time um, to this is the time of year when the, the flowers um, are, are blooming and the birds are active and breeding. So and the right whales as well are, are up um, in the in the region. So it's, the, it's without doubt the, the, the best time to go. All of our tours include a trip to Kirstenbosch um, Botanical Gardens. Um, Kirstenbosch is a fabulous uh, botanical garden, one of the very best in the world. Um, they only plant the, the native uh, 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 flowers and plants here. It's over 7,000 species of native flower have been planted in, in, in Kirstenbosch. Um, and it's a great place to introduce yourself, not only to the, to the native flora, uh, but some of the fauna as well, because they plant a lot of all, they, all native uh, flowers. Um, in September time, the flowers of the proteas, the pincushion plants, the leucospermums are in flower, um, and they attract um, a lot of the, the local bird life. Um, there are several species of, um, of um, sunbird that are endemic to the Cape region. Uh, this is the, the Cape sugarbird, a male here with its long tail. And the, the beautiful orange breasted sunbird on a, a leucospermum, a, pin, a pink cushion plant. So there's some really interesting birds and some fantastic flowers to see in Kirsten Bosch. It's just a, a nice introduction um, to your time around the Cape. And the other, the other um, near endemic to the Cape region is the uh, beautiful Malachite sunbird. Um, and the biggest of all the proteas, the magnificent king protea, is quite difficult to see out in the wild, but um, they, they do occur in Kirstenbosch and some of the other botanical gardens in the region. Um, and then after you've had your introduction to the flora and fauna in Kirstenbosch, we'll take you out to explore the, the Cape Peninsula itself. Wonderful scenery, the, the mountains, um, the slopes covered in this amazing Feinbos uh, vegetation, which is one of, uh, there are eight floral kingdoms worldwide, one of which is the, the so-called Cape Floral Kingdom. And it's home to over eight and a half thousand species of plant, a lot of which are endemic um, to, the, to, the, to the Cape region. Um, and so the Feinbos covers um, the, the Cape Peninsula and we'll take you out on just gentle walks through this fantastic habitat and through scenery looking for the birds and enjoying the flowers and the other wildlife to be seen. Um, so it's incredibly diverse um, uh, floral kingdom, it's most more, even more diverse than some of the rainforests in the world. Um, we've got six species of heather in the UK. In the, the Cape region there are over 600 species, so it's in, incredibly diverse and very colourful as well in, the, in, the, in September. We'll take you to Boulders Beach, home to um, one of only two mainland African penguin colonies. Um, and you get fabulous views of these wonderful birds here. They, um, their population is increasing um, and great for photography and they're even, they're even um, burrowing underneath some of the, the houses that are on, on the sandy beach. And of course, you can't come to the Cape at this time of year without enjoying the, um, the uh, sea mammals. The southern right whales in particular come into the, to the, the sheltered bays along the coast in False Bay and, and Walker Bay. Um, to make and give birth during the um, South African spring. So they're arriving at June time, normally staying around until October when they head down into um, Antarctic waters to feed. This is one of the few places in the world where you can whale watch from the land. There's no need to actually go out on a boat. You can sit on the cliff tops at Hermanus just outside the, um, the, the Windsor Hotel where, where we stay on some of our trips. And you can see the whales out in the water, um, out in the sea below you and to get fabulous views of these amazing, amazing creatures. And there are also right whales around as well. You can go down to the Cape Peninsula and you quite often see uh, pods, of, pods of dolphins. Um, we will take you out as well on an option, optional boat trip um, out from the Cape, out from Simonstown, south to try and find some of the, the fishing fleet, the trawlers, as they attract in large numbers of, of seabirds, albatrosses, petrels and prions. You can see a wide range of different seabirds of the southern oceans out here. And sometimes you get to see a few more cetaceans as well, such as pods of common dolphins. Um, Leon showed you ostriches out in the desert, well, around in the Cape Peninsula, you can see them backed by the, um, by the, um, the, 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 the rough seas of the Southern Ocean. Some interesting birds um, out in this, in this region, the Cape uh, rock jumper is one of the um, 
um, more difficult species to find, but our guides know a couple of really great sites to, um, to look for them. On all of our South Africa trips, we use uh, local guides such as such as Leon and, and his colleagues, um, and they meet you at the airport when you arrive, and they'll be with you throughout the, the trip. We'll drop you back at the airport again um, at the end. Um, and they're, they're really knowledgeable. They not only know their birds, but they're, they're great on their mammals. And if we're doing a trip around the Cape, then we do make sure the guide also has, an, has an, an, a good knowledge of the, of the botany as well, because that's such an important part of any trip to this region. And there's a few mammals out on the, the Cape Peninsula as well. Um, Leon showed you the Hartman's Mountain Zebra. Well, these here are, are Cape Mountain Zebra and the attractive chocolate colored Bontibok, which lives out in the, out in the Fangos um, um, vegetation. Um, and so say so we do various trips that just focus on the Cape. We also do a longer tour, a two week itinerary um, that takes you further north, starting around the Cape and then moving up the, the west coast of South Africa to the West Coast National Park and then up into the, the mackerel land itself, getting as far north as, as Springbok. And this is a, a dedicated botany tour, timed again for the um, flowering of the um, of the daisies and the other flowers, which normally happen from mid-August through to, to mid-September, but subject to the to the winter rains um, a couple of months um, earlier. And since this is a dedicated botany tour, we send a, a Nature Trek uh, botanical tour leader um, along on this trip. Quite often, uh, a chap called David Tattersfield, um, so one of one of our most knowledgeable and widely travelled botanists. After exploring the Cape and going to many of those areas I've just showed you um, earlier. We head north into the West Coast National Park. Uh, this time of year, the, the ground is covered in a wonderful kaleidoscope of, of different flowers uh, from daisies, and I'm not a botanist myself, but a wide variety of different, different species. A beautiful National Park here, right on the coast and, and out looking at, uh, overlooking the Atlantic Ocean. There's some nice birds as well as the, as the botany to, to enjoy. Um, so we've got blue crane here. Um, there's some mammals. The West Coast National Park is actually one of the better places to look for caracal, um, the very elusive cat, um, but they are seen on, on occasion, along with a wide variety of, of, of other birds as well. Um, the Bok Makeri shrike, very colourful and um, um, shrike that occurs in the drier regions of, of Southern Africa. But it's really the, the flora that we're looking in particular as we head uh, further north. Um, we've got some, some, some wonderful variety of different flowers to look for as we're heading north up towards Nuhudfil and then further north up into the Macroland. This is one of the, the rarer species, uh, Sparaxis tricolor. And then the further north we get, the more spectacular uh, the, uh, the, the floral displays um, become. Um, and the, the, the intensity of the display will depend very much on the, um, the rains, say uh, a few months earlier, but if there are good rains, the landscapes just become a, a, a wash with a one, wonderful variety and colour of, of different flowers. Up in the Namakwa National Park, which is the, the furthest north we get, um, we'll spend a couple of days up here enjoying the flower and the, uh, the flora and the landscapes and the scenery. Um, and there are over seven, um, so the Macro National Park is over 700 square uh, kilometers. It's very dry and dusty for much of the year. But in the spring, if the rains have been good, it comes um, alive. And there's over three and a half thousand species of, of plant that have been recorded just in this one national park with maybe up to a thousand species that are endemic um, to the Namakwa land um, um, region. So it's, it's just a fantastic um, area of, of South Africa, quite different to the traditional safari holiday that we think of when we, when we, when we think of, of Southern Africa. Um, and so that's certainly an area I would very much recommend. But now I'm gonna take you back on safari again. Um, we're gonna leave South Africa. Um, we're gonna head north um, up into one of my favorite countries, um, Botswana. And this time we're flying into Johannesburg rather than flying um, into Cape Town. So we're flying direct from London, um, normally on a British Airways flight down to, down to Joburg. And there we're changing aircraft and depending on the tour you choose, we're either flying from Joburg up to Morn, which is the, the gateway to, the, to um, Botswana's Okavango Delta, 
or flying up to Livingston and, and the Victoria Falls. So if you're going to join our two week uh, Botswana's highlights trip, then um, we're flying up to we're starting in Livingston um, and then moving after a couple of nights in, in Livingston to enjoy the Vic Falls. We're moving through uh, Savuti, um, so through Chobe National Park, down into Savuti and then spending um, time exploring the Okavango before flying out of out of Morn. So that's a 14 day holiday with nine nights of, of mobile camping and a couple of nights in Livingston at the start. If you're doing our shorter 10 day Botswana's Desert and Delta trip, then we're flying in and out of Morn um, from Joburg. And then from Morn, we're heading up into the Maremi Kwai area of the Okavango Delta. And we've got seven nights of mobile camping in, in the Okavango region uh, on that particular trip. And I'm going to show you um, a bit more Tell you a bit more about the Kalahari tour that we do um, a little bit uh, a little bit later on. So what has Botswana got to offer? Well Botswana is one of the most fabulous safari destinations anywhere uh, on in, in Africa. Um, ben rightly loves Kruger National Park again wonderful place but for me Botswana is, is sort of the, um, the the king of the of the, the safari destinations. It's still home to a wonderful variety of, of big game um, animals. Um, the visitor numbers are generally quite low. It's quite a, it is not a cheap destination, it has to be said, but um, you pay a little bit more, but you do get the smaller lodges, the less, the less people and, and the less visitors, but just a fabulous um, variety of, of animals. So for us, we think that the one of the one of the key reasons to go to Botswana is to get the wilderness experience. And to do that, we'll take you out on on a mobile camping safari. So you're not staying at the lodges um, for most of the time. You're out uh, camping out in the bush, out in the wilderness, just surrounded by the wildlife um, and away from um, away from the crowds. This is quite a typical tent that, that we use um, on our Botswana camping safaris, both on the desert and delta trips and on the on the longer safaris. They're twin bedded tents. They're perfectly comfortable. This is not obviously not super luxury, but they're uh, perfectly comfortable uh, camp beds, proper bedding, proper pillows um, and um, your own little bush toilet um, out, out at the back. Um, with a bucket shower that the guides will fill up with warm water for you when needed um, and, a, and a shower area and a loo area open to the uh, open to the, to the to the elements so it's basic but it's perfectly comfortable so it really does allow you to get out into the wilds and experience um, the real Africa. Um, another great thing about Botswana is that you travel around in open sided safari vehicles so you have uh, a shape shelter um, over the top to protect you from the sun but they're open-sided so great visibility great for watching the animals and the birds and also great if you're if you're a really keen um, photographer again we use local guides in, in Botswana and the guide will meet you at Moan airport take you out on the safari and then bring drop you back at the airport again um, at the end and they're, they're great guide really very friendly very knowledgeable great trackers know their birds and know that know their wildlife um, really well and then you're of course you're accompanied by camp staff as well because you're so you're not expected to set up your tents do any of the camp chores at all you're on holiday you're there to enjoy yourself so there are there are there are um, there's, there's a camp team who will do the cooking and do the the, the the setting up and taking down of the of the campsite for you um, and really you know, what is there to say about Botswana? It's just a fabulous one, so wildlife destination. The, the main focus of most people's visits is the, the wonderful Okavango Delta, one of the great natural wonders of, of the world. Um, and uh, the Delta is fed each year from water that's fallen in the Gangolan highlights, about high, um, highlands about 500 kilometers away. And it takes months to slowly make its way down the Okavango River and then fans out over this amazing inland delta um, over a period again of, of, of several months. The water reaches the, the head of the delta normally in March, April, and then over the next few months slowly fans out to cover a vast area of over 50 
thousand um, square kilometers. It's so flat here that the water actually moves at a very, very slow pace. So even though it arrives in the north of the delta in March, March, April, um, it may not reach the end of the, the, the far end of the delta near morn until July, August time. It's moving normally at about a, about a kilometer um, a, a day. Um, and in the, the delta itself is a mix of um, open, uh, uh, flooded grasslands with with small islands. There are large areas of mapani and leadwood um, forests, um, and so it's quite a wide variety of different habitats to explore, and um, and which are home to an equally wide variety of, of mammals and and birds. Um, Elephants, of course, are common through, throughout um, the Okavango Delta and also in neighbouring Chobe uh, National Park as well. And there won't be a day when you won't get some fabulous views of these um, uh, um, amazing creatures. Um, ben showed you the buffalo in, in Kruger, uh, where there are equally huge herds of, of buffalo roaming around the, the Okavango Delta and, its, um, and, the, and, and the parks um, on the edge. Some of these herds can number a couple of thousand animals strong. Zebra as well, the Birchall's uh, zebra um, are common uh, throughout the, the park. There are also water buck, impala, blue wildebeest, tessabee, so a wide range of different big mammals to, to enjoy. If you're very lucky, maybe that's uh, that major rarity of Southern Africa, the, the two-necked giraffe. Um, but if you don't see any of the two neck variety, there are plenty of the of the, the one necked cousins around. These are these are subspecies called southern um, giraffe. And uh, greater kuda as well. So for me, one of the, one of the most beautiful of, of, of all the antelope species and um, and quite commonly seen um, throughout the, the delta and the, and the surrounding areas. And of course, where you've got the prey, you've got the predators as well. And the Okavango and Botswana, northern Botswana, is home to um, a plenty of lions. Um, and you'll see lions on, on, on many occasions during your, your, your safari. And they have very little fear of, of, um, of people in vehicles. So again, offering uh, wonderful photographic opportunities for, for those who like to take their camera and lenses with them. Um, and again, the, 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 the leopards as well, um, there, there are plenty of leopards in, in the Okavango, as ben, um, Neon mentioned, they are one of the more elusive of the cat species. Uh, you stand a reasonable chance of maybe seeing one in the middle of the day, hauled out on a, on a branch like this, relaxing in the, in the heat of the day. Or if you go out on a night drive, then you may see them then. Um, but I guess the, the key mammal key predator people want to see on a trip to northern Botswana is the the wonderful um, African wild dog um, and I would say the majority of our tours to, to this region see see wild dog and of course we can't give you any guarantees in in the world of, of wildlife watching but our guides know where to go they know where to look and even though these amazing animals range over huge um, um, areas they're always on the move um, we stand a good chance of finding a pack. If you're particularly keen on wild dogs, then try and go um, at a time when they're denning, which is sort of July, August, September time. So if you go for one of our trips in September, that probably gives you the, the best chance of all to, of seeing um, these this, this um, amazing and increasingly rare um, creature. And of course, wherever you've got the predators, you've got the scavengers as well. Plenty of spotted hyenas um, live in, the, in northern Botswana commonly seen uh, throughout throughout a safari. Now I put this, this um, image in to illustrate what it's not like in, in Botswana. So this obviously isn't Botswana because it's a big hill in the background. Um, Botswana is pretty much as flat as a pancake, but you don't get the big crowds of vehicles like this in, in, in Botswana. It's one of the great advantages of going there. Most of the lodges are small, so they don't take, in some of the countries, some of the, the, the safari lodges might take two, 200 plus people um, in Botswana most of them are much, much smaller. So you don't have the numbers of visitors um, exploring the parks and so you don't tend to, to get the crowds. Um, and the bird life as well, of course, is absolutely fabulous. The whole of Southern Africa is blessed with the most incredible diversity of bird life and Botswana is, is uh, one, of, one of the best areas for birds. We, our, our tours to Botswana, we have 
the desert and delta tour, sorry, we have two different types of desert and delta tour, one that focuses on the mammals. So for those who are particularly keen on mammals, um, look at that one, but that, that one of course doesn't ignore the birds. So we'll still be looking at the more colorful, obvious birds, but we probably won't be sifting through little brown cysticulars and flycatchers. But if you're a particularly keen birder, then go for the birding trip because that will um, focus more on the on the on, on the birds and include some of the trickier species to see but no matter which trip you go on you'll certainly see the wonderful lilac breasted roller um one of the most spectacular birds i think in the whole of southern africa and, 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 a, and a common species throughout the region another dazzling species is the uh, southern carmine beater um, for anybody who's been to Africa, to, to, sorry, to Zambia, down to the South Luangwa National Park, you would have seen the nesting along the, the riverbanks there in, in August, um, September, October time, um, when you're in Botswana. That, um, you, 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 there are some nesting colonies there, but you, you also see a lot of uh, non-breeding birds as well, but a, a wonderfully spectacular species and one of maybe you know, half a dozen different species of bee eater that you may well see on, a, on, a, on your safari. Um, in the morning, um, there's no need to have a, um, an alarm clock wake you up because you may well be woken up by the wonderful song of the white browed robin chat or the hooglins robin. This wonderful strident song is a very familiar sound in the morning and uh, as well as the, uh, the, the, the cooing of a, of a million uh, cape turtle doves, which is one of those characteristic sounds of, of southern Africa. And just blessed with the most wonderful variety and, and colour of, of bird life. Here we have a southern um, red bishop and a pintailed wider. So if you go in the in the dry, drier months of the year, which are traditionally the best months for mammals watching, so say between um, July, August, September, down into November, then a lot of these widows and widers and weavers are in their non-breeding plumage. So they're very small brown and sparrow and stripy. If you go during the some of the wetter months of the year, and we do a birding trip in April, May, as well as later on in the year. So if you go in during after the rains, then they've molted into their spectacular breeding plumages. So a wonderful pintail wider here with their long um, tail streamers, paradise widers, widow birds. They're just a wonderful different variety of shapes and colours to enjoy. And talking about colours, um, the emerald cookie, cuckoo here is one of, again, one of the most, one of the more spectacular species that you're, you're going to see or hopefully see on a trip to Botswana. But these are, the, the cuckoos as a family tend to be um, better seen in, in the wetter months of the year, as soon as the rain starts in, in November time um, and the landscape greens up, then a lot of the intra-Africa migrants will move into, into Botswana um, and in particular the, the, the colourful cuckoos. Not quite so colourful, but again, nice to see is the grey lurry or the go away bird, so named for its call. Its call is go away, go away. And lots of raptors, um, a lot of um, birds of prey that uh, summer up in the northern hemisphere migrate down to southern Africa um, for our winter, which is their summer. So there's a wonderful variety of, of different raptors to enjoy. This is a tawny eagle, but there's also African hawk eagle, redneck falcon, Wahlberg's eagle, step eagle, marshal eagle, battler, African harrier hawk. The, the range is just um, absolutely uh, vast. Um, one of the specialties of the Okavango Delta in the, some of the, the, the wetter areas of Maremi National Park, you can look for the uh, majestic wattled crane, um, quite a, a rare species these days, but, but regularly seen so in some of the wetter areas of the Delta. Um, and in the, so we split, we split our Okavango, our 10 day trip into um, four nights of camping in Maremi and, four, and three nights of camping in the Kwai concession. And in the Kwai, since you're not in the Maremi Game Reserve, you can do a few more things there. You can do walks, you can do night drives. So we'll often take you, we will take you out on a, on a game walk and you can do night drives as well, which you can't do in the Maremi Game Reserve. And on the night drives, you stand a good chance of seeing the spring hare that uh, Leon showed you earlier, maybe hunting cats like leopards and lions and hopefully a few nocturnal birds as well. If you're very lucky, the spectacular pennant winged nightjar have these wonderful elongated primary feathers um, and they're at their best when they're, when they're flying around, um, but spectacular birds. Um, 
and then most of our tours will will end in morn um if you want to extend your holiday we have a lot of people who want to go right into the heart of the delta um, where you get the permanent waters by september october november time a lot of the water has actually receded and is starting to recede back into the heart of the delta as the as the drier months progress but you can fly into the heart of the delta over this amazing landscape of patchwork of of rivers and lakes and islands and stay at one of the lodges within the, the, the wetter areas of the Delta. This is one of our favourite, this is Maremi Crossing Lodge. It's in a per area of permanent water. So rather than doing game drives, you can head out on the Coros and uh, do um, 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 boat trips um, and walks as well. Fun, really nice accommodation. And I say you, you head, you spend your days either out on the water doing doing boat trips or uh, out on foot rather than on game drives. And on water it gives you a whole new perspective on the, the landscapes and the wildlife. And you can see so many um, wonderful birds. The African chicana here is, is commonly seen. Lots of kingfishers, the little malachite kingfisher is one of the smaller species up to the largest in, in the whole of Africa, which is the um, the, the giant kingfisher. Um, lots of other water birds. We've got the wonderful um, black black heron or black egret here doing its um, a fishing uh, technique where it, it creates an area of shade on, in the water, both to cut down the glare so the, so the bird can see through the water easier. And also scientists reckon so the, the fish will actually make, will head for the shade um, and, um, and, and, and the heron will get its prize. So from the smaller one, again, up to the largest, the Goliath heron, which is the largest heron in the world. And the, one of the great um, birds that the birders want to see in Botswana is the amazing Pell's fishing owl. And if you really want to see this bird, then it's worth heading out into the wetter areas of the Delta. Um, and um, they are more commonly seen out in the wetter areas and the drier regions. And also the, some of the smaller species as well, little painted reed frog are commonly seen as you're, as you're kayaking, as you're macorrowing around the area. And plenty of hippos, of course, in all the wetter areas. And also those specialties, there's the Sitatunga, and again, you have to go out into the wetter areas of the, um, of the Delta to see that. Um, and so that sort of gives you a, an overview of the of, of the Okavango region and um, the um, Maremi Game Reserve. And most of our tours go up to that to that region because, without doubt, it is the most diverse and area of Botswana for for, for wildlife. Um, but we, of course, it's, it's a vast country. Uh, it's a huge country, like it's twice the size of of, of the UK. Um, but with a population of only two point three million, so you can appreciate how. Um, sparsely populated it is. So if you've been to the Okavango and you want to see another area of Botswana, then they may not, why not return and head down to the central Kalahari game reserve. And this area is well out of the reach of, um, of the Okavango Delta. So it's much, much drier, um, very flat, very dry, home to Hemsbok and, um, that Leon showed you earlier. We go and in a very similar setup in terms of the, the accommodation that we use. It's a mobile camping safari again. So we set up the camps for you in two different locations in the central Kalahari, Passage Valley and Deception Valley. We go in February, March time, right at the end of the rains. Um, so then you they don't get that much rain down in the Kalahari, but the rains they do get means you get this flush of green, flush, wonderful um, sudden um, flowering at that time of year. Um, and it's much, much uh, greener and more pleasant experience to going at that time of year than, than later on when it's much drier and, and hotter. Plenty of, of, of wildlife to see here. Blue wildebeest um, are common. Springbok is the, is the commonest uh, small uh, antelope down here. Um, and you don't tend to get those up in the Okavango because they prefer the drier um, areas of, uh, of Southern Africa. And of course, where you've got the prey again, you've got the predators, the, the black maned lions that Leon showed you earlier. So the habitat here is very similar to the to the um, to the deserts of, of northern uh, northern South Africa. So you get a similar variety of, of wildlife. There are cheetah in the Okavango, but they can be quite difficult to see here. So if you're particularly keen on seeing cheetah, then the Kalahari is a great area to look for them. They like these wide open um, areas, um, and they prey on the on the springbok. Wild dogs occur in 
um, in the Central Kalahari Game Reserve, but they're but trickier to see down here. We did have a, a, a group out in March last year, just before lockdown uh, set in, and they were very lucky to see a pack of wild dog while they're out on the safari. Um, meerkats uh, occur here, the, um, and they, they, they're not commonly seen in the Central Kalahari. There are, no, there are no habituated groups here, as you can get down in, in South Africa, um, but you do stand a good chance of seeing them. Plenty of birds again, plenty of birds of prey, um, pale chanting goshawk. At, even though um, Leon and Ben showed you the Cory Busted, I had to put it in because it's the national bird of Botswana, a wonderfully majestic bird commonly seen uh, striding around out on the grassy plains. And some lovely colour as well to, to enjoy the crimson breasted shrike and the, the aptly named violet eared waxbill. Um, and spotted virtual sand grouse. There are various species of sand grouse here. And if you're sitting by a waterhole in the evening, you often get several species of sand grouse coming in to drink and to soak their belly feathers. And they take the water out back into the deserts again to, um, to their thirsty chicks. Some unusual species. If you really want to see the, the rare mammals and the, the trip that Leon was talking about, South Africa's rare mammals is the, the, the tour to go on. But, you, but in, in Botswana, you stand a chance of seeing these, some of these more unusual species. Bat-eared foxes are not that uncommon, actually, and frequently seen. Aardvark, maybe, but you know, you'd have to have a good degree of luck to see aardvark in Botswana. And you need an exceptional amount of luck to see uh, pangolin. We've had a couple of groups had have struck lucky um, and you know, we're always keeping our fingers crossed for more. But that is the this is the absolute pinnacle of, uh, of, of the, the rare mammal enthusiast. And the night skies here are absolutely fabulous. It's got no light pollution at all. So when you're, you're out camping, when the sun goes down, you can look up and you get a wonderful vista of the Milky Way and a countless numbers of stars. Now, our Botswana's highlights trip starts at Victoria Falls for a couple of nights at Vic Falls, um, but we can extend any trip to Botswana or Namibia or Southern Africa, come to that, with time up at the Victoria Falls. And these are the falls in the, um, in the wetter months of the year, earlier in the year, um, in, um, um, so from about March, April through to, um, into, to May, June, they're in, in flood, but if we're, if you're going on after a safari, after a safari in the autumn, then they more typically actually look like this. Um, spectacular in its own right. You can see more of the gorge. You can actually see more of the, of the falls. One of the problems in the flood is that if you're walking close to the falls, you're just enveloped in this mass of spray and you can't really see that much. So actually I prefer the falls in the drier uh, months of the year when you can see the gorge and you can see more of the, uh, the falls um, themselves. We stay at a lovely lodge called Waterbury Lodge, um, and we can we can um, um, use this lodge again for an extension if you want to extend your tour uh, to Victoria Falls. And there's some more interesting birds to be seen here as well. There's Charlo's uh, Lurry, a uh, beautiful, beautiful bird that's quite quite common around the falls. Trumpeter Hornbill as well. So, since it's a different habitat, a, a much lusher. Um, riverine forest here. You get a different variety of birds than you would do in other areas of Botswana. You can also do a sundown cruise on the um, on the Victoria Falls, uh, Victoria Falls on the Zambezi River, um, or if you're um, um, uh, the adventurous type, you can even go bungee jumping as well. But uh, that's not something I personally would would recommend. And there are also some rhino here. The, the Monte Antonio National Park has a small population of, of white rhino. It's the only place in, in Botswana at the moment where the, the, where the white rhino occur. So I'll end there. I see I've overrun slightly, so I will end on that uh, classic sunset shot um, over southern Africa and just say thank you very much uh, for, for listening. Um, and if you have any questions at all on any of the destinations we've covered tonight, please uh, do let us know. Um, and um, I'll leave it there and head back and hand back to Sarah. So thank you very much. Great, thank you so much, Paul. That was uh, brilliant. Love seeing all of those photos there. We've had quite a few questions come in while you've been talking. So we'll kick off with some of the ones we've got here. Uh, Jenny Edwards is asking, are there biting insects in the Okavango? Is there a better time to avoid? What are the temperatures like? 
Um, well, I've never really found insects to be that bad in the Okavango. Yes, there, there are mosquitoes around. It's a, it's a wet area and wet throughout the year. Um, but you know, as long as you take the sensible precautions and wear long sleeve um, um, shirts in the evening, etc., then a bit of insect repellent, I've never really found it to, to be a problem. Um, you, you, you do need to take malarial tablets, malarial prophylactics, if you're going to, to Botswana, because there is malaria in Botswana. But I've never really found them to be to be that much of a problem myself. Okay, thank you. And uh, Catherine Dodd is asking: Is the rarity of pangolins that you mentioned due to poaching in that part of Africa? Um, well, I might hand that one to Leon. Actually, he may he probably knows more about uh, pangolin numbers and conservation than than I do on that one. Do you know Leon? Yeah, um, it's probably a. Uh, it's a naturally an animal that you just don't see often at all anyway, but obviously poaching is exacerbating that. Uh, poaching is not quite as bad here as it is in other parts of the continent, uh, but I, I guess it is having some kind of effect. Yeah, I'd, I'd just, just jump in as well and say, you know, this, it's a species that's very selective in what it eats. So, I mean, the ground pangolin, it, it basically eats termites and ants and, and only a sort of select few species of termites and ants. And so actually the, the resources that it has to feed on are pretty sparse. So actually each individual needs a pretty large territory. Um, so actually they are, as, as Leon said, they're very, they're very naturally low density species as it is. Uh, and certainly as, as far as I'm aware, poaching isn't the main cause of its rarity in, in Southern Africa. Although of course there are some of the rainforest species further north are kind of being taken out of the forest at kind of rates of hundreds of thousands a year. Um, yeah. Thanks, Ben. Um, a question for Paul or Leon. Um, on the Just Cats tour, is there an opportunity to take drives? Sorry, say again. I didn't hear that question. Sorry, on the Just Cats tour, is there opportunity to do night drives? Mm. I'll let Leon answer that one since he's, he's led it. <laughs> yeah, definitely. Uh, we got uh, night drives in both the Kruger National Park and uh, the Sardin Sand Game Reserve. Um, so we've got, I think, uh, about six night drives all together. So definitely, it's part of the fun. <laughs> and uh, asking, where are the best chances of caracal in Botswana, Paul? Ooh, um, <laughs> very difficult. I'm not aware that any of our groups in Botswana have seen caracal. I, I guess probably the best chance would be down in the down in the central Kalahari game reserve um, but they're very very difficult but we are doing a caracal tour to South Africa um, in July time um, where we're going to the West Coast National Park and a couple of other areas that will probably give you your best chance of, of, of finding in finding caracal they are you know if you're very lucky they are a species that can pop up in a, in a few areas on our tours but they're quite tricky so our caracal tour to South Africa would be your best bet yeah Thanks, Paul. Um, what's the best time of year to visit the Okavango Delta? Question from Tom Hill. Um, for, for mammals, I, I guess it's the same as much of Southern Africa. So the drier months of the year um, from August through to, to October. Um, if you want to see the Okavango in, in flood, then a couple of months earlier um, would, be, would be better. But it's one of those places where you, know, you can visit at any time of year and you're going to have a fantastic experience with with heaps of, of, of birds and other wildlife. The only time I would probably avoid would be in the middle of you know, the, the, the wettest months of the year, which are, are December, January, um, February time. OK, a question from Rachel Oakley. Which is the best tour to see African wild dogs? Is there a best time of year to see? And for best chances of seeing a variety of mammals, is there much difference between South Africa and Zambia? Ben, ben do you want to take a wild like dog question? <laughs> <laughs> sure. I mean, I think so. Yeah, well, I think we've, we've, Leon and I both did a little answer to this in the, in the comments. Uh, Northern Botswana is, is the biggest stronghold for wild dogs in Southern Africa in terms of absolute population size. Um, the largest single population left on the continent is in Tanzania in the Salu Game Reserve. Um, so that, that's another option if you if you really want to see wild dogs. Um, but I think northern Botswana certainly historically has, has been the place where the consistency of sightings has been the highest. Although, as Leon mentioned in the um, in the sort of comments, 
uh, the Just Cat store, it seems, has had a 65 to 70 percent um, rate of seeing them over the last sort of 10 years or so, which is, for, you know, for what is a very elusive species, an extremely high success rate. So and my personal experience in Kruger is that the fact that you can travel quite large distances really helps in finding them. I don't know whether, whether Leon would agree with that. Um, yeah. Plus, plus the fact that you know, you've got, you know, the, the guides are communicating with each other. Um, if, a, if a wild dog pack has been spotted, you know, 50 kilometers away, you know, you, you might well decide to do a game drive in that direction to look for them. Um, so the, the Kruger is definitely, I've, I've had some fantastic sightings of wild dog and Kruger, um, having gone there sort of specifically trying to look for them. Um, I don't know whether you want to, to say anything, Leon. No, I think between that and my comment there, it covers it. Uh, well done. I think the, the time of year thing is interesting too, because um, you know, as Leon said, the kind of the best time in, in Kruger seems to be immediately after they've denned. Um, when they're actually actually denning, um, it can be a little bit trickier because they, they they can't go very far from the den site because they've got to get able to get back to feed the pups. Which means that if the den site is far away from roads, or if you're in northern Botswana or somewhere else, if it's in an, an area that isn't very accessible from the camps, then actually you might have a period of several months where it can be very tricky to see them at all. Um, but if, if, the, if the den site is very close to a camp, then you might have guaranteed sightings every day for two or three months. Um, so it can be quite unpredictable. And I know in Zambia, in South Luangwa, actually sightings have been more consistent in the wet season, which uh, they den in the dry season, so the, the sort of opposite time of year. Um, they're more wide ranging at that time of year, so they can kind of pop up anywhere. Um, Ultimately, it's a it's a pretty hard species to to sort of predict. Um, and Kruger, Northern Botswana, Zambia, all all give a very good opportunity for seeing them. Uh, I couldn't couldn't recommend going and looking for them highly enough. They really are amazing. Great. I was going to say just to add that the sightings in Zambia have certainly improved over the past few years or so. As Ben was saying, the the, gr the green season. So later on in November, December, January, February, um, our groups have been. A, over the past few years have been have been pretty fortunate had some great sightings in South Africa. Thanks Paul and you've got continued comments coming in to us thank you so much for, for everything you're you're saying to us so we've got uh, Sharon is saying another evening of great presentations and more additions to my wish list thank you very much so thanks Sharon and um, we've had a practical question now from Jane Vincent uh, in the bush camps will there be an opportunity to charge batteries etc uh, yes, yeah, the, the, the guides, the safari operators in Africa are well aware that everybody these days uses digital cameras and they need to charge their digital cameras and they need to charge their phones and they need to charge everything. So yes, there are charging uh, facilities at the camps. Um, the, the, some of the vehicles will have special, I don't even know the details, but special areas where you can plug in um, um, charging, um, charging for phones and, and batteries. And if not, there will be other ways of doing it. So simple answer is yes. Great, a question from Claire Stairs. Would the May or September departure of South Africa's rare mammals give better chance of encountering African wild cat and black-footed cat? A question for you, Leon. Uh, it's probably a pretty even chances. Um, I guess at the end of the day, like anything, it boils down to a lot of luck. Um, but yeah, the chances are, are good on both of those, those departures. Great, thank you. Um, we have a question from Karen Smith, um, who's if some of the trips can be combined, for example, the rare mammals um, to Western South Africa with Namibia, she'd like to stay out longer. So Paul, is this possible? If I would have to check our, our, the, the, the dates just to see which trips can be combined, but if they can, then yes we can combine tours if they run if they run back to back then we can find you a way of getting from one trip to to the other be it by by um, by aircraft or land transfer or whatever um so the other the other thing is you know if if uh, if the trips don't run back to back but you want to stay out longer then we're more than happy to arrange an extension for you um say so if you're talking about botswana then a lot of people extend into the okavango you can extend to victoria falls since most flights go through South Africa, you can you can extend to Kruger and places in in South Africa as well. So there is a an infinite variety of, of different extensions that we can we can offer to make a shorter trip longer. And a question uh, for either Leon or Ben. Uh, Ruth Samways would like to know when is the best time to see young lions in South Africa. 
Um, yeah, lions are totally non-seasonal, so like pretty much all your big, well, apart from the wild dogs, as we, as we now know, but you know, all your cats are non-seasonal, so you can have uh, babies at any time of the year. Um, so it's really a gamble. Uh, we've on the Just Cats tours, we've been fortunate to see quite a few lion cubs, um, but yeah, that's, that's pretty random. It can be at any time. And uh, Sharon Mathai, is it possible to do walking safaris in any of these locations? Um, you, you can do you can do short walks. Well, we offer short walks on the um, Botswana tours um, when you're not in the game reserve. So when you're the quite risk concession, you can walk. If you go into the Okavango, and again you're in private, you're staying in a private concession there. Again, you can you can walk there as well. Um, I, I would have to go to, 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 to Leon on, on walking in, in South Africa. Uh, yeah, you can certainly do on, on the sort of uh, set tours, uh, like just cats. Um, there's normally a short morning sort of hour to two hour bush walk included at a lodge stay. Um, if that's enough, then you can do that. If you want to do more uh, on sort of tailor-made options, you can start looking at uh, overnight trails in the bush and more. Um, so it is possible, it just depends how much you want to do. Really. The, the, the classic walking destination is Zambia, the South Luangwa National Park is where walking safaris first started. Um, and we offer um, a, a range of different um, walking options in the South Luangwa, some that walk from camp to camp, others that do just shorter day walks. So if you're particularly keen on walking safaris, then I'd certainly recommend having a look at the, at the South Luangwa National Park. I guess, I guess I'd say just, just quickly as well, um, that like the night drives that you can you can book in Kruger, um, the camps do also arrange sort of walks that you can do. And I, I guess if the timing was right, you could also, if you were prepared to miss the game drive that was guided by Leon or one of the other local guides we use, you could you could go out on a walk from one of the camps um, there, um, but it would mean missing part of the, the rest of the tour, but it would be possible. Thanks, Ben. And talking of walking and wandering, David Rumsey asked, is it possible to wander in the grounds of the accommodation and bird watch safely? Um, well, on, in, when you're doing mobile camps, you, you're, the areas you can walk are pretty restricted. You will be within the campsite, so no, you can't walk too, too far there. If you're, say, in Waterbury Lodge on the edge of the uh, Zambezi River, then, then that lodge has got large grounds and you can, you can do a lot of, a lot of wandering there. I think some of some of the Kruger camps are pretty large as well, so I'd imagine you could um, probably do your own own birding around around there. Yeah, and they're all they're all fenced, so um, no danger of being attacked by anything. Uh, but then there's there's very little danger of, of that even in the unfenced places too. Should probably point out. Great. Okay. Thanks, Ben. Uh, Sally Yeshin asks, how many people do we? Um, uh, in each safari vehicle. So I didn't catch that question. Can you say it, say it again? How many people go into a safari vehicle? Um, well, in 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 Bots, Botswana, um, on the uh, Botswana's highlights trip, we have a maximum of seven people on that particular trip, um, and so everybody. So we have two two per row, and then one sitting next to the driver. On the shorter Botswana trips, we take slightly larger groups. So some of the some of the the, the the seating has three in a row um, but we rotate and because those vehicles are open and they're large everybody still gets a gets a great view um, but it does you know and, and it does depend on on the tour in question and in South Africa we use some of the tours have open vehicles some of the tours where we're traveling large distances have um, more enclosed vehicles um, so if there's a, I would just say if, if there's a particular tour of interest let us know um, send us a, an email or give us a call at the office and we can let you know exactly how many people we put in in each vehicle but we always make sure that everybody gets plenty of space and that everybody has good visibility thanks paul uh, lovely uh, comment come in here from charles sheffield who says thank you for continuing to host these they really have made a difference for us helping to uh, make the inability to travel a bit and he's asked a question on this side of the pond uh, I'm wondering if you're in uh, America, Charles. Uh, Gabon is starting to get some birds as a destination for wildlife. Is this somewhere Nature Trek is looking to add? Paul, we are always expanding our portfolio of destinations. Um, I'm, I'm not yeah. sure if we're currently looking at Gabon. 
Not at the moment. We did actually offer Gabon a few years ago, and then and then the government closed down all the um, all the great wildlife areas. Um, and I must admit, I don't know whether they've reopened up again. I've not. It's not a place I've I've looked into recently. Um, but yeah, if and when it does open up, I'm sure we'll be back. Yeah, there have been some fantastic trip reports on um, on the mammal watching websites from Gabon. Um, people seeing things like giant pangolin, which are, you know, almost basically as mythical as as wildlife in Africa gets. Um, and they're lowland gorillas and all sorts of things. So I mean, yeah, I'd certainly like to go. <laughs> <laughs> well, bear you mind, Ben. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, John Packer is asking, on the subject of walking, are there trips where there is little walking to do? Uh, Paul, I'll point that one to you. I think perhaps the go slow in Africa, uh, South Africa. The, 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 the go slow to the Cape certainly is not much walking on that, but I would say in most, on most safaris, typical African safaris, you're doing very little walking. You're getting up in the morning, you're having a cup of coffee, you're getting into the vehicle, you're doing your game drive in the vehicle, you're back at the lodge again. Of the camp siesta and then a repeat in the afternoon they would say there are, there are some of the places there are walks but they are optional you don't have to go out on them um so most safaris actually are are, are are pretty pretty easy really with 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 very little walking and on the same note uh, rachel thomas is asking about the botanical west cape tour that you were mentioning um at the beginning of your talk paul how much is on foot or in vehicle Presumably a bit on foot if you're if you're walking around looking at the gardens and things. Yeah, if, if you're talking about the Namaqualand tour, um, wildflowers of Cape and Namaqualand, we 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 try and keep people out of the vehicle as much as possible, really, on 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 that trip. And actually, to be honest, around the, the Cape in general, since you can you can do a lot of very easy walking, you don't have to travel huge distances. Um, we try and be out on foot as as much as as much as possible. So that's a bit of a it's a bit different. We're not going out looking for mammals, and we're going out really studying the, uh, the the flora. So we're trying to be out of the vehicle as much as we can. On the Namaqualand trip, there are a few long distances to travel, um, but yeah, in, in in general, we try and be outside as much as we can. And uh, one for you, Ben. Do any of these trips have chance of seeing hundreds? a question from Rachel Oakley. Uh, if I'm honest, well, I mean, I've seen, actually the only place I've seen honey badger is in Kruger. I've seen them in quite a, a couple of the camps there, um, uh, especially around the time if you're, if you're cooking something on the barbecue or the braai uh, for dinner, they seem to have an unusual habit of just sort of turning up to try and work out when you're, when you're going to drop something. Um, Satara, which is one of the, the camps that are most of our Kruger trips do visit, um, they, they come in at night to, to pick, pick up sort of scraps and things. Um, you wouldn't be guaranteed to see them, um, but there is a chance. Um, and then on night drives and things, there's always, there's always a vague possibility of seeing them, although they do tend to be quite scarce. Um, I, I don't know, I mean, they are seen in the Kalahari and some, some of the places where the rare mammals tour goes, I know. I don't know whether, Leon, what your sort of best rec recommendation in South Africa would be for honey badger. Uh, I think I'll second you on that one. That's Satara area in Kruger National Park. Uh, even lucky enough, we sometimes see them out of the camp in the daytime uh, foraging around. Um, but like you say, uh, throw some meat on the fire in the camp and uh, there's a good chance they'll turn up there. <laughs> great. Thanks both. Just had another comment coming from Adrian James, who says thanks for another great evening and set of presentations from Adrian and Sheila. James, thank you very much both for joining us. And I think that is all of the questions that we've had uh, come in now um, to the end of our evening. I'd like to give a huge thanks to all of our presenters for joining tonight and a thank you to all of you at home for tuning in. This is a 16th presentation evening we've run so far. If you've missed any of our previous ones, don't worry, they are available to watch via our website. If to our homepage, you'll see a link to our online roadshow webpage, and the links to them are at the bottom of the webpage for you to enjoy and watch at leisure. If you'd like back, it's very welcome. You can contact us at info at naturetrek.co.uk. And finally, if you're a member of a natural history club or society and a Nature Trek speaker to deliver a talk online uh, to your members for free then we'll be delighted to do this for you. Please just get in touch, be happy to arrange it. 
We'll be back at the same time next Thursday evening on the 25th at 7.30, where we'll be talking about the joys of butterfly and botany holidays in Europe, taking you to Spain, Italy, France, Croatia, and Slovenia. So we hope you can join us. We'll stay online for the next five minutes or so in case anyone has any last minute questions. But uh, until the next time, take care and good night, everybody. Good night. Thank you. Thank you.